Gail, thank you very much indeed. We have about 15 minutes for comments from the floor for questions to both our experts. After that, we will go on to uh, listen to the advocacy groups that are coming in at, at 3 o'clock. Um, question there, comment. Susan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wonder if it might be useful uh, to avoid c confusion further down the line to exactly explain what the gender quota legislation means so that people understand it's about the selection of candidates and not that seats are reserved in Parliament for, for, for women. Thanks. Okay. Let's take a couple of comments first. Uh, Katrina. Katrina Ruan, August Um just in relation to um, the implementation of quotas, and I, I'm come clean, I, I, I believe we, we do need quotas um, because it's the only way we're going to really change things. Are there examples? I know in our party we, we only started improving um, representation was when we took proactive measures in relation to quotas in decision making, quotas in candidates, quotas in ministers, um, and, and it, it is working, though all of us have a long way to go yet. But I wonder, would you comment on the impact of quotas? And if quotas are removed, was there an adverse impact as well? Thank you. And could one more comment over here, and then we will. Alban. Uh, Alban McGuinness. Um, just one point in relation we, uh, to the, our own STV system. Uh, in the continental systems, most of them would be a list system. Probably an easier way of, of creating a quota through a list system where there's less local uh, competition for uh, candidacy. Uh, would you like to comment on that in relation to our, our own system here? Thank you. Thank you. Let's now take comments from both of you in whichever order you wish. Uh, thank you very much for uh, those uh, uh, comments and the clarifications, and uh, Gail and I will share that uh, between us. Um, in terms of uh, the clarification of uh, the existing legislation, um, Section 6 of the Electoral uh, Amendment um, Political Funding Act says that uh, this is a candidate quota rather than a reserved seat. There is no such provision as a reserved seat provision. You certainly, as Gail said earlier, find that in, um, in a number of countries such as Rwanda, such as uh, countries in, uh, in, in Asia and uh, in other places in Africa. But what, what the uh, current legislation provides for is space for women to come through the selection processes within the political parties themselves. That's what that's about, so that the voters get to choose who they want to represent them and get a wider choice of who they want to represent them. So that's what that's about. Um, the interesting thing about that uh, type of legislation is when it was introduced in Denmark, it um, increased women's representation very, very quickly. And over a period of time, the, um, the increase sustained itself to the point where Denmark repealed its statutes on gender candidate quotas. And since then, it has sustained women's representation without the aid of uh, gender quota legislation. So that tells us that what this type of mechanism does is it allows for the uh, obstacles that may exist in political parties to be broken a little bit to enable women come through the process of candidate selection, which is the party's responsibility uh, and can be sustained once that is in effect over a period of time. Um, I think I'll turn to Gail for other comments and maybe you refer to the electoral system. Um, okay, thank you very much for your um, input. Um, quotas come in a variety of different forms and some are more effective than others. Obviously the reserve seat um, provision 
has been implemented in a lot of Asian countries because there are even there are really really significant obstacles to overcome for the representation of women there, um, and that's not really um, on the table here in um, Ireland or in most European countries. Another distinction to make is that a lot of countries have voluntary um, quotas and. Um, uh, there was some kind of half-hearted attempts at that in Ireland uh, with little success. But a lot of left-wing parties in Spain and Scandinavia started this in the 70s and 80s and with considerable success. And it remains the fact that in countries like Sweden, quotas are actually voluntary. But you perhaps, you know, in some you need them least where, you know, in countries with um, equality is already enshrined in um, society. Is it easier to, you know, implement quotas in list systems? Possibly, because the parties, you know, I mean, the parties actually um, control the, you know, control the nomination process um, much more um, rigidly in those um, in those situations. But I would say, you know, I mean, the flip side of kind of your argument, if you want to take it to the extreme, is that there are no women at the local level, perhaps, to be nominated. And this just isn't the case. You know, I mean, there are women within the parties. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have large numbers of women among their rank and file and their membership, and I don't think it'll be any problem finding um, qualified and um, viable women candidates to run. Thank you. Let's go to the next round of comments and questions. Catherine. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Catherine Murphy. Um, get a, just say before I, uh, uh, before I um, ask the question I want to ask, just to uh, clarify where I'm coming from, I, I actually think quotas are required if we're going to, if we're going to uh, move things on. Having said that, I'm an independent, so it won't, uh, it won't impact on me because uh, uh, we, we, independents are not, uh, are not covered under the Electoral Funding Acts, so, uh, so I'm commenting on what's going to happen in political parties. But I'm wondering if it moves beyond the uh, uh, legislative, legislative provision and into the constitution, and if it's a, situa a situation where any part of the country there isn't um, a 30%, a, a they, they don't make the 30% rule for either gender, would the general election likely to be, would it likely, is it likely that it could be challenged, the entire election, or what would be the law in relation to that? Thank you. Let's take another couple of comments at the back there, uh, table, I'm not sure, a Amy, yeah, Jim. Jim Darcy, just to clarify one thing about these, uh, from, from the top table, about these candidate quotas. It's a funding issue, isn't it? It's not, uh, I mean, if the, if the parties are not, have no mandatory duty to provide 30% of the candidates, it means that if they don't, they lose funding. It's as simple as so. It's not. It's not actually a quota. It's an incentive. Uh, uh, it's a financial incentive to have more women candidates on your ticket rather than uh, a mandatory uh, quota of candidates. And uh, uh, could, could, could I? Uh, I know that some parties. You mentioned the voluntary quotas. Some parties are bringing the, the voluntary quota in for the local elections, even though it's not due to the next general election. But I do feel that uh, I would be interested to know if the, these countries, these 17 uh, countries that have these high quotas of high, high, high percentage of women, is there a list system in a lot of those countries? Okay, we'll, I think we'll take those two questions now because they're relatively similar and there are four people that I, I, I see that want to ask questions or comment. So. Okay, um, well, um, this is uh, a, a very interesting uh, debate. Um, I, I don't think that um, a general election uh, could be challenged or ruled out of uh, order or whatever the appropriate phrase is, uh, just because a particular um, constituency didn't have um, just 30% women candidates or anything like that. I think it's going to be up to political parties to decide how they are going to uh, show that they are including uh, women candidates uh, in their election uh, um, in their election slates or in their election lists. Um, and that's going to be up to the parties themselves to decide. Um, 
it's not going to um, mean that the uh, general election is null and void if they don't. What it will mean if they don't reach the uh, required percentage of women candidates that they will lose funding. So that's... Pardon me, pardon me. Well, putting it into the Constitution raise, raises uh, a number of questions. Um, and it depends on how far one wants, one wants to be specific in the Constitution. If one wants to have a general principled statement of equality of women and men in uh, uh, public decision making, including politics, or if one wants to specify uh, the exact uh, uh, amounts uh, and the exact proportions. And it would make m more sense if a constitution, uh, constitutional amendment is being discussed would be to have a very general one that does not just confine itself in one particular area, but that may extend much more widely in other, to other areas as well. Um, and also, um, the question is, if one, has, um, if one has provisions that are already working well or are already uh, being tested in voluntary or relatively voluntary ways or in legal manners, in a legal manner, then maybe there is no need to put a quota provision into the Constitution. So there are issues that can be discussed, but it's up to you to decide to, if you wanted to have uh, a clause that said, well, if, uh, if this actually will make the, con the a general election null and void. There's no hard and fast rule on that, but it wouldn't make an awful lot of sense to make a uh, general election null and void on the basis of one principle of that kind alone. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, Sorry. No, do you want to continue? I didn't want to yeah. interrupt no, you. No, no. Gail, do you want to say anything? Um, yeah. Um, we do have quotas, or as the gentleman, I think Jim Darcy said, you know, there's a sanction for not meeting the quota through the party finance bill into the future. Um, it's an incentive for parties, uh, you know, we're loosely calling it quotas. If you were to put it into the Constitution, you know, you can go one of two routes, I think. You can have some sort of aspirational notion that we want kind of political equality and we should kind of enact statutes to um, ensure this. Or you can go the way of somewhere like Rwanda, which says 24 of the 80 members of the Rwandan parliament must be women, you know, uh, and two each from each province and two from the city of Kigali. Now that's very specific and I don't, you know, I think people would be reluctant to go down that route because it would lead us open to all sorts of um, problems um, legalistically. So those, you know, you, can, you could opt for something quite vague and aspirational and then you have to ask yourself, is that a good thing to have vague you know, aspirational issues in the Constitution, you know. Um, if you wanted something with real legal standing, the reserve seats would be the way to go, but I, I really think realistically that's not going to um, pass a referendum and it's not perhaps going to even um, meet with approval of sitting members of the Dáil. Um, now, how effective, I suppose, is the current electoral reform bill is another question which has been touched on. And yes, the parties don't know, have to actually find 30% of their candidates. I'm, I suspect some of them, you know, Sinn Féin and Labour are almost there, you know, and I'm sure Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael will go a long way to finding some. Um, but, you know, and they lose money, you know, and money, <laughs> money matters to parties nowadays with professionalised campaigns. Um, but it is the case that when France first introduced a very similar sort of quota, that some of the right-wing parties were quite happy to take the sanctions rather than find the women. So we'll have to wait and see how it plays out in the next, um, you know, five to ten years. And perhaps we'd be better off waiting for that to play out and see how the electoral law, how effective that is, rather than getting kind of muddled up in constitutional amendments on it. But again, as Yvonne said, that's for you to decide. Okay, we're getting tight on time and we have our advocacy groups uh, ready, but there were four people that I saw, uh, and I would ask them maybe to make their points as succinctly as they can. We may not go back to the experts in res to reply to them, and, but they can be replied to at a later stage. Two, two, two comments from table five, uh, one from table three, and one from table nine. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Tom Burke. 
Uh, I know that the women for election in their submission said that women are less likely to put themselves forward. I wonder if we moved from a PR in a multi-seat constituency to PR in a single-seat constituency where you'd have a lesser number of constituents, would that encourage more women to get involved? Also, we have TDs at the moment act as messengers, look for free travel for a constituent or looking for the grass to be cut. If that was banned and they were required by law or by the constitution to deal solely with national issues, would that also reduce the workload and encourage women to participate? Thank you. Thank you. There was another comment at table five. Eileen. <coughs> thank, thank you, Chair. Aideen Hayden. Um, I think Yvonne partly addressed it in, in, in something she said, um, that gender is not the only measure of equality in terms of the electoral system and in terms of the representational system, and particularly in relation to social and economic disadvantage. I mean, there are clear links between economic and social disadvantage and representation. And you mentioned uh, the potential for a wider, a wider constitutional clause, and I was wondering were there any practical examples of wider constitutional clauses that covered issues such as social and economic disadvantage and representation. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to store those until, until later. Here, table three, please. Uh, th thank you. Michael McCarthy, table three. Just a couple of points. I, I'm not entirely convinced of the, merit, uh, the merits of quotas myself. I want to cite a number of examples where women got elected when, in the absence of, of, of um, quotas. I'm standing beside someone who was elected to both the European Parliament and Dáil Éireann in the absence of quotas. But Maureen O'Carroll, the mother of the comedian Brendan O'Carroll, was elected to Dáil Éireann for the Labour Party in Dublin Finglas in 1957. Eileen Desmond, who was mentioned in some of the material here, was elected to uh, both houses of the Oireachtas and the European Parliament and was the first senior um, ministry holder to serve in cabinet um, um, from females. That's not to belittle Maura Gagan Quinn's ministry in the 70s. So in terms of the, the, I'm not entirely convinced of the merits. So my question is this, do you think or do you think that the introduction of quotas will see more women elected because you can't put a provision in there that obliges or enforces the electorate to vote for a particular candidate. And there's another question here, just in relation to the surveys, is there a touch of the Bradley effect about the surveys? I mean, is the voter telling the pollster something and then going into the ballot box and doing something completely different? Thank you. Thank you. Michael, a final comment here from table nine, please. I just wanted to clarify, state funding will be reduced by 50% if, if parties don't run 30%. But I just also want to clarify, just in case it's, it's kind of been lost, that doesn't mean that each political party has to run, let's just say, a male and a female in each constituency. They don't. It'll be the overall figure around the country. Okay. Maybe you could just clarify okay. that, please. I think, um, I, I w thanks very much, Mary. I, we're going to... I well, maybe these can be dealt with. Some of these can be dealt with fairly quickly, and then, then they're dealt with, and, and we'll go to the. But the uh, various advocacy groups, could you come up now we're, to get ready for your presentation? Yeah, could you could you yeah. maybe deal okay. with them now? Yeah. Um, I, I'll deal very briefly with some of these. PR single seat would it help women? Well, the first past the post system doesn't help women at all. Uh, PR single seat uh, uh, system is is, is a pretty much a variant of that. That isn't going to help women get elected at all. That's going to narrow their chances. Um, if women, uh, if TDs focused on national issues, would that encourage women? Um, possibly, possibly not. Um, many women um, uh, go into politics because it is something in their local area that they feel needs to be addressed, as many men do too. So, um, so that uh, uh, element of it is is open to question, and I'm not so sure that if we have people only looking at national issues, uh, that they won't actually get out of touch with the people that they represent. And there's an issue around around all of that. Um, in terms of um, of uh, the fact that individual women have uh, been elected without any aids, that's absolutely true. Um, but the mere fact that you can actually single them out and name them indicates how few of them there have been elected over these years. So the question has to be. Um, uh, are we opening opportunities for women to be elected? And it's not that they necessarily 
are definitely going to be elected, it gives them more of a chance of their numbers being increased. Because at the end of the day, it's up to the voter to decide. And the voter may not decide to go for a woman um, a party candidate over a male party candidate. Okay. Um, just to reiterate, PR in a single member district absolutely won't help women. Um, and we'd lose the proportionality and there would be all sorts of things going on. You need at least five, six seat constituencies for true proportionality. Um, banning constituency service, uh, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> voters love it. Even the whole narrative of the last campaign was, oh, we need to concentrate more on policy issues. And then when you ask the voters what they really thought TDs should be doing is spending more time in their local area. Um, there's always exceptions, as Yvonne have sa has said. And we don't have time to discuss survey methodology. But no, we've looked at aggregate data, and it backs it up. So voters may, you know, citizens may try to please pollsters, or they may lie to them. But on the whole, we just really can't find evidence from electronic voting or aggregate data either. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed.